September 25, 2007, in a shed at a local fairground. When the deal went missing, um, David thought that he had just run away from home. And then the time was going on a lot more further and further. And then David started to panic then for his mate. People were out searching everywhere and all that. And he, the longer he was going on, he was really worried for Dale's safety then. Dale was found down in um, Puth Hall Fairground. And um, well, that really cut David then. And he came into my house then and I said, I'm sorry to hear about your mate, David. And he was so distraught that he was looking through the back kitchen window and he said, Mama, that's my brother, I love him to bits, you know. You know, he said, I don't know what I'm going to do without him. And I said, please, David, you won't do anything silly, will you, David? You know, I, you know, I don't know, I'd, I'd ever cope if you did that. And he said, Mum, he said, I'm going to see the world. I'm going to make you so proud of me and everything. Shortly after his conversation with his mother, David Dilling hanged himself. The man was walking his dog and found David hanging in a wooded area by their church. And I just, I just knew there was something wrong. I just had a feeling. I just knew when the police came that, because the way David was crying, I had a feeling that I, I know, I begged him not to do anything silly, but I just had a feeling that there was something badly wrong. I just, you know, I just knew there was something not right. And before they told me that I'd lost my son, I told them, and they said, "How did you know?" And I said, "I just had a feeling that um, for some reason I weren't going to have him long." Left so quick. At the end of the day, 19, that's that's not life. It's only just begun, haven't it? Still a kid. You see, I knew myself kind of close, very close to this church, see. So you see, I had, uh, he had a bit of God in him, I think. My wife don't like coming down here because she thinks she's just talking to a stone. But I said, no, his, his photo's by there and he's sitting by here as well, like, so you've got a picture of him doing that. You know, to keep, keep your spirits up, basically. You know what I mean? When I had to go and identify him, like, it's like the sort of thing, um, I wouldn't want anybody to do it. Like, it's, it's like they, they don't clean you up or nothing. You go and identify the person as they bring him in. So when he hung himself and they cut him down, they took him in, put him on a bed, like, basically, and you've got to go and identify him. So I seen him where, do you know what I mean? They say it's difficult to say, like, but I seen where one eye half open, the other eye open, and they're like white. You know what I mean? And it's like, it's um, really, I can never get rid of that image. It tears, it tears a bit out of, your, out of your chest, pulls it out, and you can't seem to get that back again. My wife knows the way she is and everything. She's not the same. She's totally a different person, completely different person. I don't think I'll ever, but ever have her back as she used to be. It's too painful to think. Um, and then you sort of like, put yourself um, in a little imaginary little place as if he's still out there with his mates and everything because that's, you know, a nice little comforting place to imagine, you know. It's, um, and when I have dreams, I have dream, you know, dreams of my son and I, I'll be back as a, you know, a nice little family, you know, in my dream. And I don't want to wake up from my dream because it's so comforting. I used to be a quite an outgoing girl, but I found that it's me, it's made me such, a nervous person now, and, and uh, that's not me at all. It's like, I don't know who I am. You lose your identity when you lose a loved one. You know, you lose your identity. It's like you don't know who you are anymore sometimes. But when I did first lose David, I can remember that I went up to the spot where David was David, and I just thought I wanted to be my son, because I thought, I, got, I can't leave my son on his own. I need to be with my son. I went up there. And I thought, I just want to be with him. And then I just, I thought, I can't, I have to think about my children. I can't, I can't do that, you know. But I was tied, I always sometimes I would feel tied, tied two ways, you know. I want to be with my son and I want to be with my children. It's an awful place. I don't want to leave him on his own, that's what I feel like. And then I also want to, I, I'm in two places. Sometimes I don't think it's hit me properly that I've lost him. And I feel like one day I'm going to wake up, you know, and really, I'm scared then. I'm really scared that, you know, I wouldn't do it. I don't want to do anything. I hope I don't, you know. I hope I don't. My daughter, Nicola, she um, drank herself 
Um, she had, had so much to drink that she ended up in hospital when we first lost my son. And I was really devastated. And then she took some tablets and we actually ended up in the hospital with her then through that. So I do worry about her constantly. And then she says, I can't live without my brother. Because when I look in the mirror, I'm so like my brother. I can see his face all the time and I want to change my face, she said. Because I can see him in the mirror all the time. It's, it's really a sad shame, you know, because there's been so many young young children taking their lives. To me now, it's like the only thing that the youngsters want to do today. I just wish he knocked my door, like, and started to chat about it, because no one, no one even had an inkling, inkling why he'd done it. I personally don't think he, he wanted to die. I think it was a cry of hell that went wrong, to be honest with you, that. Why are so many kids hanging themselves? I don't know. I, I don't even think it's a connection. I don't I just think it's just... Fame. One person does it, and that one thinks, oh, look at all the funeral, look at this, look at that, I'll do it. Nah, I it's silly. Think, uh, I just think yeah. it's a coincidence as well. It's so, it's so many things have happened around this area at the same time, like, do you know what I mean? It's a coincidence if one or two or three or four or five, yeah, I know, six, yeah. but 10, 20, <laughs> Like yeah. I said, people are doing it because of they, the first thing comes to their head, they get upset and they think, oh, how did everyone else get out of it? How did yeah. everyone else deal with it and hang yourself so they don't realise when you kill yourself, it's not coming back. There's no way you're going to, it's not you're getting out of like one little argument, you're just ending your life or anything. Stupid thing to do. It's the first thing that comes to everyone's minds around here. So young, and so bored, nothing to do. Argue with someone, seems easy, but out and they go and do it. Get drunk and do it. Shit thing. Would you ever kill yourself? No, I'll never kill myself. No, no never, no. Not after what Tom's done. Never ever. Because I wouldn't put my family through what Tom has put his family through and his mates. I'd never kill myself either. I wouldn't like to do that to my family and my friends. I know I felt and it weren't nice. He was very loving towards me. He'd tell me everything except the one thing, which was worst. Um, Why do you think he did it? I don't know. That's the one thing he never talked to me about. And what's, what keeps coming into my mind is when they found uh, Ty Dylan, um, he said, I can't believe my mum, he said. And one of my other friends now, he said, you know, I knew daily a bit, he said, but I, know, I really knew Ty. I said, you never do that to me, would you? Thomas said, I'd never do that to you, Mum. I love you too much. And two days later, he done it. Only moments after laying out his suit to attend David Dilling's funeral, Tom Davies walked to the tree where his friend died and hanged himself. The one policeman he went, and he said, I know it's Thomas, he said, but you still got to identify him. He said, so we are 100% him. Because all the way there, I kept thinking, somebody's pinched his wallet and his phone when he was drunk, and it's not him. But when I got there, it was. And it's the worst thing in the world anybody can do is see their child. Especially when they've just come out from one of the storage freezers. Because he was ice cold. Because when I went to kiss him, I nearly stuck to him. That's how cold he was. And it's the worst, I wouldn't put my worst enemy through that. Zach was Zach. He was special. Zach was Zach. You know, around here, he was Zach. He had this personality and this glow about him, didn't he? Family and friends. He's a great kid, he was, really. Every, everything was so, going so brilliantly for him, work wise. It, just, he was in a frame of mind where you would never think of it. You, you wouldn't even think he would do it. There's no way on this earth. There was anything to indicate that my son was going to kill himself. This happened on the weekend, till on the Monday then he buys his weekly pass to go to work. So there's 20 pounds on his sock when he was found. That's not a child yeah, intense. That's not somebody life. that goes out to the end and to do that. You don't keep you don't keep your money too. You know for your next week's ticket. And the next thing he's found lying on a line hanging on a line from his t-shirt. We used to climb and he used to do pranks and things. See? So I'm thinking, did he climb and did he fall? Did he was a prank that went wrong? He was found on his knees hanging from the washing line. And I had to see him to believe he was dead. I had to see him. And the police wanted me to see him. None of them wanted me to see him. My, and I saw him in the morgue. I had to. Because if I didn't, it weren't true. I mean, I 
and at first, you know, he was bad. <clears throat> you know, when you first see him, you know, after because he had choked. So the, his tongue had come out and everything. The, you know, after then, Rigor Mortis had gone and his tongue had come down. He was beautiful again. Where did him all when he was beautiful? He was beautiful. Yeah, but he was There is such a thing as a broken heart, and your guts being ripped out. And I never, ever thought for one minute that I would be going through this, or my family, or my children, ever, ever, in a million years, ever. The pain, and I know Zach didn't mean to do it, because he wouldn't have done it to us. He wouldn't have put us through the pain. I know he wouldn't have. He drank too much, and he'd done a silly thing. And that's my belief. Bereavement by suicide is, is different to other forms of bereavement. There will be um, a lot of questions. You know, why did they do it? Um, could I have stopped them? I should have seen, um, you know, some symptoms. You know, why didn't I see any symptoms? If somebody dies by eternal illness or a car crash, they can perhaps get closure in the fact that they know why their death happened. But with a suicide, they, 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 they don't know why, why did that person die. The number of deaths that occurred in Bridgend County certainly is a staggering amount, really, and a lot higher than, than the statistics would suggest that you would get in, in, a, in an area of, of um, Bridgend County's population. What we don't know is why those people were suicidal. The police have found no evidence linking the death to social networking sites on the internet. It may just be a chance cluster, but that doesn't answer the question why so many of the area's young people are taking their lives when they would seem to have so much to live for. There will be um, reports in the media that say that, um, you know, that they had everything to live for, that they didn't have any issues or, or whatever, but that is only what the people around those who died actually saw and are now reflecting on. What we don't know is what was actually going through the minds of those who died. Zach, I will never forget you. I can't wear. I will always remember your cheeky smile and I was make me laugh. You were a loyal, helpful, happy friend. Also an amazing laugh to be with. You were the type of boy to go out of the way to walk your mates home. So they weren't on their own. I still got that necklace that you gave me. I'll always keep it safe. I can't think why you would have wanted to waste your life. You're the third special friend we lost now. You had so much going for you. You're gorgeous and I'll never, ever forget you. So, Alicia. Another one is, this is what left up where he did it. Miss you always. You were a sparkle to my eye and my heart. You were a gifted boy with a lot going for you. Cute and smile to light up every room. The first person I knew then with all the hangings, uh, the, the, the so-called pretend hangings that were going on was um, Zach Barnes, um, a friend of mine who I work with, um, texted me to say that Zach had been found hung. And, well, it was just devastating. I, um, I'm a teaching uh, assistant and, I, and Zach was a pupil in the school that um, I work in. In fact, he was, in, he was one of the first classes that I was ever in. And I was with him for about four years. And um, it was, just a horrible thing to, to hear about because the last we heard about Zach, he, he was starting to pull himself together and, you know, he was hoping to join the army. I just couldn't believe him. It just sent me cold because, you know, you'd heard about the suicides, but I didn't actually know anybody. And then, you know, with Zach then, it was, it was horrible. Me and my husband, Dean, just sort of sat down and, and we had to chat about it that night. And uh, he said that, um, you know, he can't believe that people are doing this. And he's just you know, the most selfish thing to do. We just said, you know, we just hope and we not we never have to go through it. Taffy. 
as a parent, you think you know your kids. I thought I knew Liam like the back of my hand. You know, he was my son. But uh, when they do something like this, you find out you're deeply mistaken. You don't know him as well as you thought you did. You know, everything was running normal. I don't seem, you know, not that we knew of that he had any problems or any worries. Um, I can't say really, it's just nothing at all. Tell me about the night Liam died. He'd gone out with his girlfriend and his mates, and then he came home, I don't know, about half 12. My wife woke up, and his girlfriend was back at the house, and they were having a bit of a high-level discussion. So she got up and said, look, you know, you're not going to have none of this in the house. Said, you can go home, get a taxi, and uh, Liam, you go to bed. So he got dressed and decided he wanted to go for a walk. So his girlfriend had a taxi home, and that was it. I got up for work the following morning, didn't think anything of it, went to work as I normally do, and... Uh, it was about half past nine, I think, half past nine, quarter to ten. We had a phone call. Um, I had a phone call in work then, could I come home quick? Um, the police were at the door. They found a body in uh, the local swing park. And uh, they said they couldn't identify him at the moment. You know, they'd found a body, could we go down and uh, identify him? And the police took us down in the car, and there it was, it was him. It was under the slide, and he used his jacket. He rolled the sleeve up and tied one end around his neck and tied the other end from uh, the bar underneath the uh, slide, under a kiddie slide. Um, he was actually kneeling, you know, on his knees when they found him. <laughs> the, the worst part of all that hits me is the thought of him hanging there off that swing. And some bloke found him at nine in the morning. He was walking his dog, you know, and just the thought of him being there on his own. Town Centre. But it used to be a very traditional market town, a place that was surrounded by the valleys. Those valleys were full of uh, mines, coal mines, but there was also farming communities as well. So Bridgend grew up as a market town. That's the reputation that it always had. Things have changed. It's just got that little bit darker. There's a tension in the air. And again, I can't quantify that, but it's just a real feeling that, you know, all is not going to end well for some people in the light. Gend is very depressing. It's scary. And scary. It's terrible. It's horrible. Honestly, fights everywhere. Like, loads of fights. There's loads of fights. People in hospital, people getting beat up. Like, I, I'd be scared to walk through town on my own and look at a girl the wrong way, let alone looking at a boy the wrong way. It's terrible. Like, you can't look at somebody the wrong way in case they hit you. And there's so many cases of grown men hitting, like, girls, isn't there? There's so many yeah. of them. Like, I've, I've been hit in town before. My best friend's been hit in town before, and she's shorter than me. It's horrible. Just, you are honest, I can't explain it any other way. You were scared. There's a lot of depression in Regent. I know a lot of people with, like, depression and anxiety. Because you're scared, it's making you upset. Like, I don't want to be scared where I live. I don't want to be scared to look at somebody the wrong way. It's been going on for years. There's been, like, loads of people hanging themselves and committing suicide. Mm -hmm. Like, through it, word of mouth and stuff as well. I was saying, oh, there's more people killing themselves because of, like, they were drawing stores and stuff, and whoever had the shortest store had to kill themselves. Yeah, and, like, it happened to, like, quite a lot of people, didn't it? A man had tied a rope to a tree near my school, put it through his car, and then around his head and drove off. So his head just come off, and we weren't allowed to go to school for, like, a few weeks just because of that. Mm. There's been a lot of... There was a lot of suicides in my school. And, like, people make it out like there's a lot of support around, but there's not. There's really not at all. It's, it's disgusting. Like, don't get me wrong, Wales is a good place. It's not yeah, bad Yeah, Wales, Wales is good. Pretend is a bit of a shithole, really. People you, call it yeah, a shithole, no. don't they? Like, where Wales is a thing is actually really pretty. But this small town is terrible.
do you feel about Tom now for having done what he did? I'm angry, but it kills me as well. Every day, like, it's horrible. He was in my bedroom, every pictures of him and everywhere. I'd wake up and see him, and I just wish I could see him again. Like, it's horrible. Angry with him, but it's no one give to see him again. You were born on uh, born on Friday the 13th from Devil Child. Everyone <laughs> thinks anyway. I don't think I am. You were. Mm-hmm. I was in a lot of pain when I after I had you, and you weren't even in the room. You were <laughs> in the nursery, him, and I'm still it. in pain. <laughs> They voodoo you in the, in the hospital. They fed you devil blood. Yeah, wow. definitely. <laughs> devil child. <laughs> devil child. Like sent me hate mail. <laughs> Fucking devil. I have, I have a crucifix in my house. Oh, they're all over. I don't know. Do you know, I, done, I, done, do you know I done something on Facebook last night, yeah? It's like, who's haunting you and that sort oh, of stuff. Oh, God, yeah. They reckon there's a, there's a lady who, who's anorexic here, and because she's so much... Yeah, because she's so anorexic, uh, upset with herself, she slit her own throat, and she, she's buried under the house, and she's watching me, and she's unhappy what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> and if I go to the bathroom and record this up past six of the night, I'm going to see her slitting her own throat behind me, and I was like, <laughs> sound. It's nice thing to tell me, innit? So, anyone, everyone, what do you guys think the reason is, then, for all these kids who have hanged themselves in the bridge end? We drink. Yeah. I, mean, drink. Drink I think it's due to drink, drugs, and boredom, yeah, boredom, nothing to do, no way to go. You yeah, know? So it's the first thing that comes to isn't it? When, like, say someone's hanging themselves, yeah, and they're a good friend of someone, as soon as they get drunk, they're upset about that person hanging themselves, and they're, they're drunk, yeah, and it's the first thing that comes into their head, and they're just going, going through and do it, like... <laughs> yeah. Most of them, it's like, oh, I don't know, it's weird the way they, the way they do it, like... It's to do with alcohol and drugs, because, believe it or not, there's a lot, there's a lot of children around here, Ambergen, that are alcoholics and on drugs. Oh, right. Because if you go around this estate, there is nothing around here for these children whatsoever. Well, there is for little kids, for the tod- yeah, toddlers, the, like, the teenagers. No, there's nothing for them, nothing whatsoever. So they end up going to the, the shop, getting flagons or even vodka. stealing slabs of beer, bottles of vodka, and they just go and they take drugs and they just get off their faces because there's just nothing else for them to do. And I think after so long of doing that, it gets to a point where you think, where's my life going? You know, it's not going anywhere. Do you know what I mean? And then when you get to that low, low state that you think my life's not going anywhere, then they think then, you know, I might as well end it. I ain't got nothing to live for, you know? I think they're so drunk they don't realise they're not going to wake up the next day because you do say, you do say like that, they think, oh, yeah, do this now. Glamour and fame, i to get off it. But you're so drunk, you don't realise you're not waking up from it. Like, just do it to spare the moment thing, don't they? Personally, I don't think they've done that for attention. Well, they didn't, because Mike Thomas done it. He was here, he came to this house. And he was standing there and he was talking and he was laughing and he was joking. And he was Thomas. I've known Thomas since he was a baby and he was Thomas. Normal Thomas, just laughing and joking, you know, had a few beers, you know, and that was him. And there was no indication whatsoever that he was depressed or run down or anything, was there? Good kisses. Hello. Oh. Hello. Oh, keep it. I don't want it. I haven't done it at all, haven't they? Oh, in Bajan. When? Yesterday. Oh, God. What? Another one dying. Where's the man? He was 29. Another boy at home, so. Man. There you go. Another man at home, so. In Bajan yesterday. See? Still going on now. No. I don't think it'll ever stop. I really don't. It has to be hard for you to hear about these other hangings. No, not my own. It just doesn't get. And I didn't know him anyway, so. I know this family's going to mind. Mm-hmm. There's no point in talking to the press because they just blow it out of all proportion. I tried to link it, saying they're packed and oh, how stupid they are. Mm-hmm. I still got him, he's in my living room, He'll always be with me. He's your son, he'll always be with you, never be without him. What a waste of life, isn't it? We well, you know people When left. you think about it, what a waste of life, really, you know? Do you know what, with the murders that are going on around here, the people killing themselves and that, there's going to be no people left around here soon.
from the time of putting a noose around your neck, you are clearly putting yourself in considerable danger. Consciousness can be lost very quickly. It might be three or four seconds. The tissues of the upper throat can be actually pulled up into the back of your mouth, into what's called the pharynx, and block the airway. Now, that probably is what happens as a terminal event in many of the cases when consciousness is lost and their full weight goes into the noose, because then the tissues of the neck are drawn up and the airway is obstructed. When did you realize that something unusual was going on with the number of hangings of Bridget? We uh, did notice in 2007 that we had a very surprising increase in the number of young suicides in particular over what we normally see. We do get suicides every year, but the numbers that we were getting were far above what we would normally expect to see. Hanging up until that time tended to be something that young men did. Um, it was very unusual to see a female hang themselves or be involved in a hanging scenario. When we had those increased numbers, it was very noticeable that after a period of time, we were getting increasing numbers of women apparently being involved in hangings. It seems that hanging has almost gained a sort of popularity for some reason. When it was mainly young men dying, the public didn't seem to, to be that bothered. It's only when you get young females dying by the, the perceived more sort of gruesome methods that the public starts to be interested and starts to, to ask, well, why, why is this happening? What's going on? Brigitte really caught the world's attention when the body of Natasha Randall was found hanging. Uh, suddenly you had a photograph of a pretty girl splashed across newspapers. Up until then it had been the death of young men. But suddenly people realised that something else was going on maybe in Bridgen. We knew Clarky, Liam Clark, he committed suicide and we went to his funeral and at the funeral she wasn't... She didn't show any emotion so I think she like held it all in but she didn't talk about it either so... I don't really know. Tell me what Tasha was like. Um, she was really pretty, tall. She had everything going for her. She was brilliant. She was like my sister. She was my confidence. Um, she was like my right hand, really. We've done everything together. We, I don't know, we were like sisters. Tasha was always so happy. I never, I didn't realize that she was, must have been hurting inside to do something like that, because obviously she was. Natasha Randall's father came home from work one night to find his daughter hanging from the upstairs banister. I just fell to the floor when I found out because she was so strong. She was, a, you know, she was the strongest character of the two of us. She always, you know, made me feel better. She was always, I don't know, so happy, and I never expected it. Please tell me you would never do what Natasha did. I thought about it at the beginning. I thought I wanted to know how she felt. I wanted to know how she felt, how she felt before she well, passed away. I know it sounds silly, maybe, but she, I just wanted to know how she was feeling. I hope she thinks that I was a good friend to her, because she was a good friend to me. Tell me about Jenna. She was quite bubbly, and everyone who knows her would tell you the same thing. She was bubbly and happy most of the time. You know, she wasn't, she, yeah, she was a giggle. If you did a giggle, it's just so contagious that you'd laugh with her, even if you went in the motor. One of her school friends that she used to be in school with a, a good few years ago... Natasha. ..had done it. Um, she promised us that she wouldn't do it. And that was so hard to take in it. Yeah. Now she's gone. The last time I saw her, she it was quite late, but I didn't realise how late it was. And she left the house. Um, usually I always say to her, where are you going now? But this night, I, for some reason, I didn't say anything. And she walked out the door. She went down to the common. And then the next thing we knew, then the police were knocking on the door. She was such a beautiful girl, you know. 
She didn't think much of herself at all. She's very low, and she very low self-esteem. Yeah, yeah. She wouldn't believe it. She'd say she no. was beautiful. She wouldn't have that. Oh, you're my mother. You'd say that. She'd just say, I'm going to say that now. Yeah. I mean, teenagers are hard work. They are. They can be hard work. But I thought we had a pretty good family here. Shortly after midnight, Jenna Perry walked deep into a secluded area known as the Snake Pit and hanged herself in the darkness. All these questions were under head. It's never going to be answered. We knew Jane Ellen. We knew that she wouldn't go down that far. It's so far out of the way, so far out of character, that um, it just doesn't make sense to us, does it? No. The seconds has gone everything. These teenagers just don't understand what they do, what they leave behind. It's, this is just unbearable, this pain is. You know, you see other people walking down the street with their daughters and it just is crippling. I'm never gonna be able to walk my daughter down the aisle or anything. It's all gone. Tell you, you've got to think of the good times. And the good times are there in your memory. But you're never going to have any more good times. Oh, God, I miss her so much. During the, the months of, of 2008, the, the media and the authorities were looking for answers to why so many young people had apparently taken their own lives. The police investigated the, the rumours and investigated the claims that newspapers had made about suicide pacts, and they have said that there is no evidence of any criminal activity, no evidence of a pact, no evidence of any sort of suicide cult. The theory that makes sense in the absence of any other evidence is one of suicide contagion. And that's where we have a death in a community, and it's as if it gives permission to others that they may now take their lives. We're not saying that, that you can put some uh, suicide into to somebody's head, because you can't. What we're saying is that there are people in the community who are already vulnerable, already experiencing suicidal thoughts, but this death that occurs can give them permission to actually to go ahead with, with the act of, of taking their lives. So many people have hung themselves, like comes one hanging, then two hanging, but it's like, if you want to kill yourself, if you're going to do it a different way, you're not going to get as much, you know? Yeah. Oh, this person's hanged yeah, themselves, yeah, it's like, it comes in the papers, oh yeah, such and such killed herself. It's not going to be like, oh yeah, you took an overdose. It yeah. would be like the rest of them hanged but themselves. But I think it's because it's quick. Yeah. But it isn't, though. It's not painless, but it's quick. Yeah, but you can, yeah, hang, but you can hang it for 20 minutes. You yeah, can. but, you know, when you take pills, you've got to wait for yourself to fall asleep or whatever, you know? If you cut your wrist, it's going to hurt, isn't it, you know? So I think that when they've had a drink in that, that's just the easiest thing for them to do. I don't think that. I, I, think, I, think, they'd, I think they'd jump in front of a train, to be honest, if they don't want to peel through on a pain. So just mm. demolish it, wouldn't it? I think it's because there's so many people that hang themselves. Yeah. It's like, why am I going to go and slip my wrist if all my mates have hung themselves? It's like, why were they going to leave a note and let everyone know why they've killed themselves? If they're doing it for the gang thing, they're doing it because everyone else is doing it, they want to be the same as them, don't they? They want to be mysterious and why, they, why they've done it, just like the rest of them. They don't want to leave a note and let everyone know why they've done it, they just want to leave it as a big mystery. Question mark, like, be like the rest of them, isn't it? They're going to join the gang, why do it differently? In the papers, they've said about 24 people. Yeah, I reckon it's at least around the 50 mark people have hung themselves like. Yeah. I think they wise up a bit because there's so many people hanging themselves and they thought every time it goes in a paper, one kid looks at it and thinks, oh, I can know, it's all over the front of the paper. Look at that, he's, he's, look how much fame that person's getting. All the people talking about it, and that's playing in the back of the mind. When they're thinking of hanging themselves, that's playing in the back of the mind, and that's pushing them a bit further as well. If then you've got, you could have somebody across the other side of the country um, who is reading about them, and they identify with that person. So they think, well, I'm a young male, I've got these money troubles, I've you know, got pressures from my girlfriend and my relationship's under strain. I've been suicidal now for, for a while, but I thought I could get through it. Maybe I can't get through it. Maybe this is what I'm supposed to do. Maybe this is the only way out. Nathaniel Pritchard was the youngest, just 15. Speaking for the first time, his parents called for an end to the speculation over the deaths. We feel he was influenced by the media coverage, which we feel was, has glamorized ways of taking your life. It may have given Nathaniel the impression that attempting suicide was a way of getting attention without fully realizing the tragic consequences.
my cousin Nathaniel and my son Dale um, have been best friends since, well, basically they were born. They within two two months of each other, so they've always been together. Nathaniel, he was my cousin. He was he was my truly my best friend at the time. We didn't hang around with anyone else. It was just us two. We were like blood brothers. And uh, that day that uh, he committed suicide, we were out all day down the rack playing football, just doing what general kids do, just having fun, having a laugh, just, just normal things. And then uh, he decided to go home because of problems with his girlfriend. And uh, about two hours later, my mum gave me a phone call. She said to get up to the house quickly. After an argument with his girlfriend, 15-year-old Nathaniel Pritchard hanged himself in his bedroom. He was found by his nine-year-old brother. His little brother had come down and said that Nathaniel was hanging in the bedroom and his mother thought that he was joking, so she said, be so silly. And he said, no, Mum, he's... Nathaniel's hurt himself. And they went up and seen him and um, they took him down and Vince worked and Nathaniel's dad worked on him for a little while until the ambulance and everything came. They, they did find a pulse and he was taken to hospital, but he was on life support then for um, a day and a half. I just completely broke down on the spot, just bawling my eyes out, basically. Um, just felt helpless. I, I couldn't understand why he'd do such a thing, leave us behind. After somebody does something like this that you don't expect them to do, it's like you worry that everybody, you know, other people in your family are going to do it, that, you know, that it could happen again then. I was 17 when I had Kelly, um, basically straight from school. Me and my husband, Dean, have been together since I was 15, he was 17. Parents aren't pleased when their children have <laughs> children very young. And it was a bit rough for a little while, but, you know, we stuck it out, we stuck together. Everybody said it wouldn't last, because Dean was a bit of a boy, you know, he liked to go out with his mates and stuff. But, you know, we worked at it, and we had Dale, and then um, we got married in that order. <laughs> Kelly was um, absolutely bonkers. <laughs> she was really, really outgoing. Everybody loved her, life and soul of the party. She just loved life. She was just so bouncy and, you know, she never walked into a room, she bounced into a room and she had this absolutely dazzling smile that lit up the room and she just made everybody laugh. One of her really good friends in school was Liam Clark. They always hung around together. They were boyfriend and girlfriend for a little while at the age of about 13, I think. It lasted for a couple of months, but they, you know, they just stayed friends mostly. Um, the day that we found out that Liam had hung himself was, well, it, it was like, day after Boxing Day, I think it was. We were just sort of sitting around. Um, there was a phone call. Uh, it was Kelly on the phone. She had just found out that Liam had been found hung. Um, she was devastated. She didn't know what to do. Kelly and Liam were, well, they were like that, basically. They were really, really tight, you know. They were, uh, they were born about a month apart. And uh, they basically grew up together, went to school together. Um, you know, they were always kicking around together. Um, and she actually spoke to me on his on the Davis funeral and said, you know, if if he was here now, you know, I'd give him the biggest kicking, you know, that anybody could what he wished to really have, you know, because what would make anybody, you know, put you through what you're going through and be so stupid, you know? She said, I just don't understand it. And then three weeks later, she did it. Kelly was on holidays in Folkestone with my mum visiting my brother. That's about a four hour drive away. We rang her to say that the news wasn't good on Nathaniel, that he wasn't gonna live, basically. They were just waiting um, on a few more tests, but it, it look, didn't look very good. But we said, you know, don't come home because, you know, my mum didn't, doesn't see my brother very often. We said, there's nothing else she can do here. We went to bed that night and um, it was, about one quarter past one, half past one in the morning, and my brother came sort of running upstairs in my bedroom and um, said, Michelle, Michelle, wake up. Kelly's hurt herself. Me and Dean sort of got in the car. It was half past one in the morning, drove four hours to uh, Folkestone. And we got to the hospital and um, said, you know, our daughter had been brought into the hospital. And they took us to a side room and asked us to wait there. Dean was going mad, you know, we watch these programmes where they take you to a side room, there's never good news. We didn't know, you know, either way what the news was. We didn't even know what she had done. And um, we were in there for, you know, at least an hour or so before somebody came to see us. 
and um, there was a nurse and she started talking to me like like I knew what was going on and I sort of stopped her and I said, um, hang on a minute, I said, I don't know what you're talking about. I, I said, you know, I said, that's all I know is that my daughter's been brought in and she'd, she's hurt herself. I said, but we don't know any other details. She's, and she said, but you know she's died. And I said, well, I do now. I don't know what happened then. I, I wasn't told the details because my parents didn't want me to, like, know. But uh, all, I, all I heard was she'd done it in the bathroom. She, well, hung herself with a coat in the bathroom. It wasn't real yet. It was, you know, we'd been told, but until we had the proof, it wasn't real. And um, we finally got to see Kelly about um, half past ten in the morning. And we'd been there since about half five. And uh, that's when it was real. It was, you know, taken to a little room and they pull back the curtains and say, is that your daughter? And it was just like the worst thing ever. You know, you still hope that it's not true even though you know where it is, you mean I'd spoken to my brother, I'd spoken to my mother by then, and I knew that she was gone, but until you actually, you know, physically see for yourself that they've gone, you, you just won't believe it. And uh, we went to see her and, and it was just the worst moment ever. We just clung on to each other and said our goodbyes. When we looked at her, she was sort of facing the window and her eyes were open. Kelly, from a young age, has always slept with her eyes half open, so she's always looked like she's awake. And it was just like, we both said, it was like she was waiting for us. Her eyes were open, waiting to see us. And we went in and kissed her. And... The coroner said, oh, you must have opened her eyes when you kissed her, but her eyes were open when they opened the curtains. And we both felt that she was waiting for us to come and see her, to say our goodbyes. There was people being hung, like there was adults hanging themselves before all this started with the kids. And my friend, her, her boyfriend, she'd had an argument with him down the pub. He told her he was going to go home and kill himself. Now, he'd already been to the doctors asking for help, saying that he was suicidal and he needed help. The doctor told him to go away and stop bothering him. He had a row with his missus. He went home. she come home later and found him hanging. That's the thing, though, even if you do go to the doctors for help, they turn you away. They say that you need to be evaluated and everything, and even if they do your you evaluation... You evaluated. No, they do, don't they? They take you oh, in, they, they evaluate you, up, and then they give you depression tablets then, and, you know, you're having a fucking bad day, you ain't going to take your depression tablets. You ain't going to be bothered to take them. You know, that's what I mean. If you go to doctors and say, look, I'm suicidal, I need help, they're like, well, we're going to have to refer you to the hospital, do an assessment, and they'll go from there to see if you are depressed or not. And they, they decide you're not depressed, they, they ain't going to help you. You just go back out on the street with the same sense of mind you walked in there with. Mm. That's probably right, yeah. After Kelly died, it was just like, you know, our world had dropped out. Dean just couldn't even look at photos of Kelly. It was just too painful. I mean, it was painful for myself for a little while, but then I felt that I, I needed to see pictures of her. I needed to see her smiling and, you know, laughing and joking. But Dean couldn't cope with it. He still couldn't come to terms with it at all. He absolutely adored her, as he, and, and he adores Dale and Kayla, our little girl. We were both off work for a while because neither of us could cope with our jobs. Um, and then, um, because Dean was in a new job, he had to go back, you know, I think he had about six weeks off, and then he had to go back to work. And it was just basically every day driving a van to Swansea, which is where Kelly used to go a lot. She had friends up there, and he, that was the area that he used to go. And he, it just used to devastate him every day. He'd drive up the motorway thinking about her and crying and drive back from his job down the motorway and thinking about her and crying. He'd been to the doctors again and they'd referred him to counsellors. We come home and I, I went to bed and um, when I got up, 
in the morning. I went to the bathroom and opened the bathroom window because it was warm and I saw Dean hanging from um, our daughter's swings in the garden. And I just run down the stairs outside. I, I couldn't believe it. I just thought, you know, I run out there thinking, oh, maybe he'd only just, he'd only just done it and, you know, I, I could stop it. But he'd been out there all night. And I just, I didn't know what to do. I just screamed, run in the house, scream upstairs for Dale. Dale came down and he went out and took Dean down while I phoned the emergency services. That's possibly the worst day of my life. Just having to see my dad's face. It's just, it's just horrible. Absolutely devastatingly painful. I, I don't know, it's just, and then I, I felt my mum even more because she had to go and identify my sister's body. And so she obviously had to see her face and having to see my dad's face as well, it's just double the amount of pain. I just don't know how she, she can handle it. Eh? I just don't understand. I don't understand what, how, how they could just leave everyone behind. It still does get me angry when I think about the fact that he's left me, my mum and Kayla on her own, you know, despite everything that we've already been through. It's selfishness is all that comes to mind, really. Nothing to, you know, remember and buying no notes, no, no anything, just pain, really. That's all they left behind. I can't explain how devastated I am. I've lost a beautiful girl who just loved everything and loved everybody, and, and I lost my soulmate, my my partner. We were going to grow old together, and you know, we'd been together for 22 years, and we were going to, you know, we planned to grow old together. And now I'm left, you know, to pick up the pieces of my 17-year-old son. You know, it's hard enough to be a teenager on a normal day without having to go through it when you've lost your sister, your best friend and your dad. And I got a four-year-old little girl who just doesn't understand it. That's, that's Daddy. That's me and I play those books. That's my Daddy. She doesn't understand about dying and, you know, people in heaven. And she always wants to say, well, how do you get to heaven, you know? And I've got to try and explain to her in a way that, I mean, she's too young to understand about how they did it and, you know, why they did it, obviously. I mean, that's something for when she's older at the moment. It's just, you know, her dad and her sister are stars in the sky that she sees on clear nights. haven't really got a reason. Most of the ch kids that have done it after their friends and cousins generally haven't got a reason. They're just grieving because it's their friends, isn't it, really? They just think, oh, I'm upset, so I'm going to go and do it, and I haven't got a reason. So you got to explain that, innit? I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm going to go and kill myself because you uh, you're drunk. Reason. You're drunk, you've got no thoughts in your head at the starters, so how are you going to explain it? And sorry, Mum, but I'm going to kill myself because... And you've got, no, you've got no reason else to explain it apart from you've seen your friend hang himself and you're upset yeah. over it. It's not a good reason to take your life. That's why like, they've they probably got no way of explaining them. I'm sure many of them wanted to, because Tom said if you ever done it, he'd leave a note. But he probably got to that point in his life and thought, what, what am I going to say? How am I going to break into my family? I've killed myself because I've got no reason. I'm just upset at the moment. <laughs> Mel worried about me when I when the Tom hung himself. He was ringing, she ringing you when she to see if I was alright, like, because she was worrying about me if I was going to do it. Well, my nan, she didn't help me, but she used to come up here and she's oh. gone in the air. So she, she used to tell me she was talking to Tom <coughs> and telling, saying Tom's going to come and speak to him in my sleep and that sort of stuff. And I was really upset. I couldn't handle even someone even saying his name. Like, And she was sitting here and I was saying, she's like, oh, yeah, he's going to come see you in your sleep. And he said he had to do what he'd done and all that stuff. And it really upset me. I just burst out in tears. I was like, just get, get away, nan. Like, no, I told she knew what she was doing. I told her to leave. My mother's a bit of, she thinks she can talk to the dead and she thinks she's a white witch and all sorts. She's got you know, if it powers. floats her boat, let her get on she's with it, wrong. you know. But. That day she come in and I told her straight, you are upsetting him and there's no need for that. You, you know, you're not talking to Thomas at all. So stop trying to make him feel better because you're just making him feel worse. Because of Thomas and, and because Justin had friends who had, have you ever worried about him doing it? No, no. I've, I've, never, worried about about I've never worried about Justin doing it, never. Because Justin, strong he's too strong-minded for that. He's, he doesn't think about, you know, oh, if I take my life, he thinks about, you know, what I would go through if he took his life, you know, things like that. So, no, with Justin, no.
This is the Bridge End Crematorium, where Justin Beecham and many of the other hanging victims were cremated. Most people in Wales choose to be cremated. Everywhere I looked, I saw familiar names. I spoke with the crematorium manager. She described how difficult it was for her and the other employees to come face to face with so many young hanging victims. I couldn't look at the countless graves without wondering, what could possibly have led so many young people to this spot? It had been a while since I spoke to the Bridge End coroner, Alan Reese, about the suicides, so I decided to check in with him. He confirmed that while the press has all but stopped publishing reports of new hangings, he is still seeing a shocking amount of hanging victims coming into the morgue. In a five-year span, he has seen at least 99 hanging victims in Bridge End. The day after Justin Beecham died, his brother came into the studio. He's really upset. Asked for a, a memorial tattoo for his brother. While I was doing the tattoo, I was asking him you know, what had happened. Um, he told me that he'd been not feeling himself for a while. And he tried to hang himself. Uh, took him to the doctors. Uh, the hospital said there was nothing wrong with him. And then a few hours later, he hung himself in like a, a local field. Well, just blew my head off, to be honest. I've, you know, I've, I've seen the guy like about two or three weeks before, done a tattoo on him. It's like, it's weird, it's like you see someone and then you get told that they've, they've done that and you're never going to see them again. It's really, it's, I don't know. I think it was negligence on the part of the hospital, to be perfectly honest with you. I think that if they'd done their job properly and they listened to him and they assessed the situation, then none of that would have happened because I tackled him a few times and I, you know, he's a proper stand-up guy. He's really sound. And I, would, I never would have seen you know, him hanging himself. I never would have seen that coming at all. He was really, you know, good head on his shoulders. He's a good boy. It must be hard tattooing so many people who have had family members like this hang themselves. I mean, when people come in here and they try to book a tattoo and they obviously let us know that their family members hang themselves, it's not a great way to, to start a conversation no. or it's, we just try to explain to them, you know, this is going to be on you for life and it's going to be a constant reminder, try to make sure that they're 100%, but it just it seems the most natural thing to do. I don't know if it's part of the grieving process or it is, yeah. if it's a way it like, they, yeah, yeah, they come in and they talk to us as well, which is really, really nice. Um, it's not the best thing to talk about, but sometimes it's better to kind of talk to a stranger and listen to their story. Talk to me about the culture of suicide. Why, why, are, all these, why are all these people hanging themselves? I, I don't know. I'm still trying to work out why people are hanging themselves. I don't know why they're shooting themselves. I don't know why they're jumping in front of trains. I don't know why they're driving over cliff edges. Um, I, I still can't work it out myself. I don't know whether they've seen it on the news, whether they read it in a newspaper, and they just kind of latched onto that whole idea and thought process of suicide. I think that's the another thing. Big time. The press suppressed the number of suicides. They've always said 17 or 27. They're, they still put a lot. It's still they, 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 not they, mentioned. There's they still a lot of suicides not mentioned in the press, this. but at the time, when a few suicides happened close together, then that's all that was in the paper. I, so I, I remember being around that point because we were looking at figures in the paper and they weren't adding up to, to what me, we were hearing. That's not helpful either as well. I, I, I'm not being funny. I, I don't want to... If I you know, if I was at a fragile mind, I wouldn't want to look at my local news, no, my newspaper and read about stuff like that because that could potentially push you over the edge even further then. But surely it's covering it up as well. It's, an, it's, it's another one of those points where if they're not talking about it, then people don't know about it. I've had some people say they think there's a serial killer disguising some of the deaths and that they haven't all been hanging. Uh, some people say it's been a pact. Some people say it's a cult. There's been devil worshippers. But... I've heard a lot of rumours about cults. I've heard a lot of rumours about uh, serial killers, etc. But I, I just generally think a, a lot of people around you get very depressed. They get really depressed and really quick. So I've noticed got that. To do, and there's no prospect of... Like, it's a dying town. I've known so of people who have split up in relationships and the next you know, they're gone. With so many kids in Bridgend hanging themselves, you, do you worry about your kids? I worry constantly about my kids. I mean, I've got a 13-year-old daughter and she's growing up in a town where it just seems the norm. You know, um, 
blah, 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 down the road, just kill himself or whatever, just kill himself. I mean, is she going to think it's trendy? Or every time I argue with her, and I mean, any any parent that they would understand this, a 13-year-old daughter can be an absolute nightmare. So I go home tonight, I don't know whether she's going to smile at me, I don't know whether she's going to tell me to get out of my room. I mean, I work in a ta- I, I own a tattoo studio, and I think I'm pretty cool. I've got tattoos, I'm a pretty cool dad, but she thinks I'm just dreadful, you know, half the time. Is she going to go down that road? That's in my mind, but I can't talk to her. I mean, I can I can bring it up, but I don't want to make it a big thing because is that fuel in the fire or is that helping the matter? Or, you know, I don't know. It's such a new generation of kids. I mean, I'm only 31, but I'm watching it change daily. It's like, I don't know, where do you start to help people around you? Do you know what I mean? Where are the police in all of this? I've tried to speak to them numerous times. They will not talk to me. Do you know if the police is doing anything to try to get to the bottom of this? Police have never come in here asking questions. I've never heard the, of the police going to my daughter's school talking about suicides. I've, I've just never heard of the police involved in it, to be honest. I think if it's not suspicious, it's not their business, sadly. I decided to try talking to the Bridge End police one more time, but the results were the same. The lady at the desk basically told me to go bugger off. But I just talked to this guy and he was nice. It's a police officer, but he said they just can't talk about it. They're not allowed to. The job is at stake if they go on camera and they're done. Their their history. They feel, you know, the suicides happen because people like us talk about it. So I said, well, just so you know, there were, you know, 55 dead kids when I got here before we ever started talking about it. So but they won't they won't go on camera. No surprise. I never thought Justin would hang himself. He was totally against it. He was angry with his friends for doing it. I just never thought he'd do it at all. On the day Justin died, he wasn't acting right. He was acting strange. Like he was here, but he wasn't here. He he went to the doctors as an emergency patient. Um, he told the doctor that he, he was suicidal, that he wanted to kill himself. Um, the doctor referred him to the hospital, but he had to wait for an appointment to come through. So he came home, me and him had a little bit of an argument. He went out in his car, he came back, told me that he'd tried to hang himself and threw a, um, you know, like a cardigan cord belt, threw that at me and said that he'd tried to do it, but it broke. Then he phoned an ambulance, ambulance came, took him to hospital. Basically, they didn't have anyone there to deal with him, so they told him to come back Monday. I ask you, what sort of hospital doesn't help a child that's come in and told him that he's tried to kill himself and he wants to kill himself? What sort of place just sends him away with an appointment to come back two days later? He left the hospital, went to the police station, left the police station. Even the doctor in the police station, though, said that he shouldn't have been released because he wasn't acting right. Came home then about, must have been about one o'clock in the morning. Um, I asked him if he was staying in, he said no. And he walked back out, and then his girlfriend come down and said that he'd gone to hang himself. So I got out of bed. I phoned the police. <laughs> and they were looking for him over the road in the field. And um, I could hear him screaming his name. And then um, I heard him scream his name because they found him. And I could hear him saying, cut him down. Um, they rushed him to an ambulance, um, took him to the Gender Hospital, and basically he was pronounced dead after like 20 minutes of being there. <sighs> Devastated. <sighs> to have to go and look at your son. 
He's just been cut down from a tree. It's heartbreaking. That was it. He was dead. He was gone. Then it was the funeral. Worst day of my life. No one should ever have to cremate their child. Never. Oh, my world fell apart. And it's even harder because I don't know why he did it. I get no answers. I've got no answers whatsoever. And I don't know why he did it. I can't think about it. I miss him so much. He was like my little ray of sunshine, you know? He always made me laugh. And I was so convinced that he would never do it. He used to say I could never do that to you, Mum. I'd never do that to you, Mum. I don't know what happened to him. Don't suppose I'll ever know the lie until I get up there and ask him. The greatest tragedy of suicide may be that those left behind are doomed to live the rest of their lives with so many unanswered questions. We may never know what led at least 90